Well, let's go on to GLP ones right now yeah. because history books, science shows us that every time we think we've got the wonder drug for weight loss, very shortly after it gets taken yep. off the shelves. Yep. Yeah, oh, yes. So we're now talking about GLP ones with all their lots of different brand names and, yeah. and NHS now actually giving it on prescription for two yep. years to certain people, uh, yes. meeting certain criteria. Um, I've got loads of opinions about it. I don't, we've not checked this one out. Let's see if we're aligned. You go first. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, have tremendous reservation. Um, interestingly, I've had my finger on the pulse of these drugs since their origins. My PhD lab, my dissertation lab, was one of the first funded labs in the U.S. to study the incretins, these gut hormones, because it was at a medical school where they were pioneering some of the earliest versions of, what, uh, of the gastric bypass procedures. And that was leading, as the guts were being replumbed, um, you know, moved around, yep. that was leading to profound differences in GLP-1. It didn't even have a name yet, if I can recall at the time. We just knew there was a bunch of hormones coming from the gut that were massively changed post gastric bypass so, so i have sorry to quit interrupting yeah. so for those that are listening um 99 people won't know this. so glp1 is actual natural we do we do yeah. produce it anyway. yeah glp1 is a hormone made from the intestines what, what's been funny for me as a professor who teaches a graduate level endocrinology course is that on the very first day of class i show my students the prototypical endocrine organs the thyroid gland the adrenal glands the, the gonads the, the testes and the ovaries these famous endocrine glands and then i show them the brain it makes hormones the heart makes hormones muscles make hormones the bone makes hor bones make hormones and yes even the intestines and among these dozens of hormones is GLP-1. And mind you, some others that are being exploited, not exploited, are being leveraged with regards to various medications. When the GLP-1 receptor agonists, so a drug now that is injected that essentially takes the GLP-1 signal and dials it up tremendously to a super physiological level. In its earliest stages, and I will touch on this in my talk today, I was quite an advocate of them because it was a relatively low dose and the only real effect was that it would inhibit glucagon. And as glucagon was inhibited, being insulin's opposite, whereas insulin wants to reduce blood glucose, glucagon wants to increase blood glucose, with the inhibition of glucagon came a very quick and often substantial reduction in blood glucose, thereby resolving people's type 2 diabetes quite well. And at the time, it was just noticed as a somewhat charming side effect that the people tended to eat a little less well, that has now been fully exploited, I'll use the word then, that now quite liberally, by dialing up this dose by four or five times, and now it's a different name of a drug, it's literally the same molecule, just at a different concentration with its own patent, and now its own name, and now the main effect is this essential, I'm gonna be a little dramatic, which doesn't suit my job as a scientist well, but it does leave an impression on people, essentially is a paralysis of the intestines. That's the main mechanism of action where people will say, I take these drugs and the food noise goes away. Yeah, it's because food is now staying in your stomach for over 24 hours. I mean, so it's it only slows supposed... gastric emptying. Yes. Which it you could do quite nicely with fiber. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, so there are that. That's part of what I end my talk with today, which is basically painting this picture that GLP-1 is undoubtedly a metabolic advantage. We want GLP-1. Protein will increase it. Fats, various fats will increase, not all kinds. Certain carbohydrates will, but so too does fiber. Fiber directly stimulates the L cells of the small intestine, which are the cells that make GLP-1. So there are a lot of ways for people to take advantage of GLP-1, whose main effect is to promote a sense of satiety by slowing the intestines down. If the intestinal movement slows down a little, it'll help you feel fuller longer. The problem with these GLP-1 agonists, these drugs, is it slows them down too much, where you have actual cases where people experience permanent paralysis of the intestines and are left to get nutrition through infusion for the rest of their life and have a colostomy bag or some other way of defecating that doesn't involve the use of their intestines because they're dead, essentially. There are, and that's at, admittedly a, a bit of an extreme end, but just but to But it put, can happen. Oh yes, it, yeah. we've known it to happen. They're yeah. documented in published reports. But just to help people maybe appreciate it uh, the most, you started this segment out by mentioning how we've seen these weight loss drugs rise and fall. What's so interesting about the GLP-1 agonists is that the fall appears to be patient-induced. Even within the UK, 
The statistics find that after 24 months of use of GLP-1 agonists, over 65% of people have, got, have chosen to stop taking it. They get so tired of feeling sick. Yeah. What we say is the food noise is quieted down. I don't crave as much. That's a nice way of saying I constantly feel yeah. like I'm going to vomit. Kind of, yeah. And they all yeah. have what they call ozempic burps. It's yeah. kind of a joke where you have food f sitting in your stomach for so long that it starts to fester and creating these noxious fumes that are bubbling up your esophagus. Now your breath is horrific. You're burping all of these gases up. And the person just says, I don't want to take this anymore. I'd rather be a little chubby or fat yeah. than feel like this all the time. And Not to mention the reports that document how they find that everything just turns gray. Not that they're depressed, but what used to give them joy doesn't. So People, you're saying their eyes actually start to sink as well? No, right? no. No? Well, I mean, the, the Ozempic phase phenomenon is just a phenomenon of losing a lot of weight very quickly. Oh, right. But it's almost as if life becomes very flat that's what right. i mean to convey what used to drive them what they used to find be very passionate about they're not anymore yeah. so there are these reports of people who they like to go on hikes now they don't really care about hiking anymore they they enjoy so, having sex now their libido is gone so they is that find what's driving some reports saying suicide is an issue yes i think well i don't know directly but i believe so that yeah. essentially they're taking everything they really cared a lot about including eating yeah so that one addiction somewhat addressed, one passion addressed, which is a passion for eating food, and they're sort of driving everything down to this flat level where they just don't, they're apathetic. Rather than maybe being depressed, I don't want to, I want to try to be precise with my wording, apathy is probably the more apt right, word okay. here, that they just don't care as much about the things they used to care about. And this is, in one sense, following, you said there's the two models uh, to reversing, let's say, diabetes. You either eat less, or you just eat right, and in other words, control calories yes. or control insulin. If they are eating less now, they're still not controlling insulin, but they're eating less, does that not then drive the metabolic rate down to match? And therefore, when the, when the NHS two years later go, sorry, you've had your two years now, you, oh, you lost some weight, well done, you can't have oh, it anymore. You've put them in have, a perfect have, position have, to have fail. We, have we killed their metabolic rate yeah, to yes, put on yeah. even more weight than they started with? Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, and, and uh, at the risk of providing a bit of a longer answer than maybe you intended, the, you easy, the easy answer is yes, <laughs> that as body weight changes, so too does metabolic rate. That's a known phenomenon. Usually, a person loses weight, metabolic rate comes down, they start to gain it, metabolic rate will come back up. Mind you, it, fall, it lags a little, which is why it's so, it's so easy to gain the weight back. However, the NIH in the U.S. published a paper finding that in people who experience dramatic weight loss through eat less, exercise more, specifically, it was based on a set of people who had participated in that game show, The Biggest Loser which I think you guys have seen here in the UK, or you may have your own version. Yeah, or you just I've, I've never it. seen the reunion party yet. Exactly. And you never will because they gain it all back. But what they found in that study <laughs> was that as they gain the weight back, metabolic rate doesn't follow. They've uncoupled these two. It, it is like they broke it. I hate to use such an imprecise word, yeah. but it's like they have broken that metabolic response. And, and interestingly... A study just published a, a very big meta-analysis from a high kind of uh, biological computational lab looked at every available study that was ever published that looked at low-carb or high-carb diets that had lost weight and then looked at what happened to the metabolic rate. And they found that on the low-fat, high-carb version, calorie-matched, always low-calorie, which, again, I'm not totally in favor of, let calories take care of themselves, they found that that was a group whose metabolic weight went down the most with their weight loss. Mm -hmm. So low carb versus low fat, yeah. they both lost weight. Yeah. This group had a substantial reduction in their metabolic rate. Yeah. This group didn't. Yeah. Their metabolic rate stayed the same. It was not a statistically significant yeah. drop. Yeah. That is profound. Yeah, absolutely. Don't tell me. So that's part of my frustration with these studies that last for two weeks. Yeah. And it's calorie controlled. Every meal's coming out of the lab. Yeah, yeah. What happens the next two weeks? And then what about the next two weeks or the next two months or the next two yeah. years? Yeah. Don't, tell, don't try to fool me yeah. with this kind of wordsmithing and, and, and yeah. confusing of the data. If your metabolic rate, even with the weight loss, has stayed as high as it was before, you've, you've broken the system, but in a highly advan advantageous way. Yeah. You've uncoupled the metabolic rate from body weight, but now in your favor rather than against you like what's happening in the other group. Yeah. One of those groups is going to gain their weight back very quickly. 
in part because they fail because they're facing hunger. The other group who's learning to rely on their own fat for fuel will not be left facing hunger. They find that they can go times without eating. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the food noise is a little quieter because the brain is sensing, I got all the energy I need. Yep. Because of this low insulin state, glucose levels are normal. Free fatty acids are higher because of the fat burning. Ketones are high. I got all the energy I need. 